Morning, thank you for joining us. I've just lit up the smoker here, blowing nice cool puffs of smoke. I've got my, my veil on. We're going to be doing a brood inspection and we'll be answering questions as we go. So put your comments in below and we'll get to answering those. So here we go. Smoker goes in the front of the hive and you've got to make sure you're getting a few good puffs of smoke right in the entrance because that'll have a calming effect on your bees and you want them to be calm while you're doing your brood inspection. So right in there, don't be shy. A couple of good squeezes. Make sure your smoke is going nice, nicely first. The more you puff it, the more it smokes, that's better. You can smoke your hands if you're going gloveless. Helps to mask your own pheromone. And then that goes in front like that so the smoke just wafts around the entrance for the returning foragers coming home. That'll help calm them as well. Now we're doing a brood inspection today just to show you and just to see what's going on in this hive here. Now I'm looking at the frame we've harvested last week. I can see there's plenty of bees in here. I'm not particularly worried about this hive but it's good to do your routine brood inspections to make sure there's no diseases in your brood box. So I can see that they've stripped off all the capping, they're going through the process of reforming all the cells and they're ready to go. Isn't that cool to see? So that's the frame we harvested last week. And we don't really need to pull this box apart. However, there's a bit of a trick. If you find this box too heavy and you don't have someone to help you lift it, then taking the flow frames out is one way to go. I'm not going to do that, I'm just going to lift it off in one go today. Now you undo your wing screws if they are done up and the roof just comes off like that. You can put that aside. Now next I'm going to get my hive tool and just go around and lift it. Now often the excluder will stick to the top box. A little trick here, when you do your first lift under here add a little bit of smoke, but also just make sure the brood frames aren't sticking to the excluder. They really don't like you lifting them very high. Just have a look in that gap here and just make sure the brood frames are sitting down. Now, if they're, if they're nice and detached, you can keep going, but otherwise you can get in there, ideally with another tool, and just push them down or anything else you've got just to push them away from the excluder. So you're going around to the corners and doing that. Sometimes the excluder will stick to the bottom box. It really depends how long since you've been, uh, how long since you've done an inspection as to how gunked up it will be. So I'm looking in there, that looks okay. I'll go around and do the other two corners and then I should be able to lift this box right off and then we'll be into the brood nest, ready to have a look in there, see what's going on and answer any questions you have. Now there's a few ways to uh, go about this. We can lift this off and prop it up against something so we don't squash the bees underneath or we could lift it off and upend it. Now if you're going to upend it, keep the frames in the same orientation. You don't want the frames on their side or nectar that they might be putting in the edge might spill out. So what I'm going to do is just lift it off and put it on its end, which will be this face. And I'll just put it out of the way so that we can get to our work doing the brood inspection. Another tip here is that's a good handle. Some beekeepers uh, uh, find there's no handles on the boxes, but we've designed it that way so that you can use these windows as handles and more importantly this one here. When you're lifting a box what you want to do is lift it in the shorter direction. You can lift it this way but it's going to be heavier if the weight's further away from you. So knowing that they're often quite full of honey what we're going to do is just rock it back towards me like this. So I've loosened it up it should come off if I just rock it back towards me so it's still a little bit stuck there so here we go there we go so that's got that free from the hive now 
and I'm just going to put it on its end like this and place it over here while we do our brood inspection. Okay, so here we are in the brood box now. Now you notice that they're a little bit agitated and I noticed that some of the frames lifted up as we lifted the excluder up because they had stuck a bit of, of wax between the frames and the excluder. Now what that means is the bees get a bit grumpy. They really don't like their, their world shifting like that. So I'm going to get the smoker going again. I'll just blow a bit more into the hive here and that'll have a calming effect. If you've got questions, put them in the comments below and Trace will read those questions out. So straight away I'm going, look, there's a healthy number of bees in here. As I add the smoke, they're uh, running away, which is what we want. And I can also see a bit of spring management looks like it's occurred, where some extra frames have been added here and here. Okay. So make sure you have your gloves. If you're new to beekeeping, you might not want to get so many stings early on in the piece. Uh, make sure you have a nice gentle introduction to beekeeping by wearing your suit, wearing your gloves. And as you get more uh, advanced, you can experiment a bit by taking your gloves off. Okay, next thing we're going to do is lift out a frame. I just blew some smoke in there, so I'll wait a little bit for them to calm again. You notice the tone change as that you blow the smoke but then they settle after that. Another little trick is you can use these shelf brackets as a really nice frame rest. So same way they attach by undoing one of these screws where you want to attach it and put it into position just like that. And now we've got a, a lovely spot to rest a frame once we pull one out. So with my hive tool I'm going to get up here again and start inspecting some of these frames. Now, you need to choose one that's easy to pull out. So don't go for one that's all sort of stuck to other frames and things first. Choose one that looks like it's nice and free. Now the first thing we're going to do is go sideways a little bit. Now straight away I'm interested because I'm not Oh yeah, I see a whole lot of brood on this frame, that's good. That's good, because what we're looking for is healthy, happy brood, so we know there's a laying queen, and just going through the frames, looking for any signs of pests or disease. Okay, so here we have a pretty light frame. This is one that's been put in more recently, and the bees have drawn out their natural comb. And look at the way they do that, isn't that magical? They've just excreted wax from their wax glands, somehow managed to cooperate on a level to create this amazing matrix, perfect for them to raise their brood in. So bearing in mind this is fresh, naturally drawn comb, we don't want to tip it on its side because they haven't really connected it very well to the edges or the bottom yet. So it might fall out if we tip it over. So, we're getting a really nice view here of uh, the brood where there's uncapped workers down here we call grubs and you can see them glistening in the bottom of the cells there. The bees are busy feeding them, raising them up and then they'll spin a cocoon around themselves. And here you can see when they've spun their cocoon and you've got a whole lot of baby bees waiting to emerge into the hive. Over here you've got pollen stores, or more correctly, bee bread. So they're collecting their pollen, they're scraping it off their hind legs, they're pushing into the cells with their head, they're adding their special sauce with their enzymes and letting it ferment like a good sourdough so it's easier to digest. Very clever, bread makers. So that's a good sign, this is all looking healthy. There's not a whole lot of brood on that frame. They could be putting a bit more. The, there's no honey flow at the moment, which means they might be dialing down the egg laying a bit. Although I can see eggs in the bottom of these cells, like tiny little grains of rice. It's gonna be hard to see it on camera. But if you, uh, 
If you wear glasses, you'll need your glasses to see the little tiny grains of rice down the bottom of the cells, and that's the bee egg. And about three days old, they, they hatch from the egg, and then they're that little helpless grub in the bottom, totally reliant on the hive to feed them. Unlike caterpillars who feed themselves, they will need to be fed for their 11 days if they're a worker bee, and then they'll cocoon themselves, go through their metamorphosis, and emerge into the hive as a young baby bee ready to work. And one of the first jobs they do is cleaning their own cells so they can be used again. It's an amazing uh, piece of cooperation here. Any questions? Yeah, great to see that everyone tuning in. And um, God, I wish you could smell through the computer because the smell of honey here is so divine. And the shots that Stone's doing today look fantastic. So I just wanted to plug you two for that. And of course, everyone noticing, see that you're in your jacket. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am in a, uh, a bee jacket. I, I do like to wear the, the jacket. The, the ventilated one is my favourite because it does get quite hot here in the sunshine. And you can feel the breeze blowing through. It's just much cooler than the, uh, than the one that doesn't have the ventilation. And some people prefer the full suit. Um, I wear pants a lot, so it's easy just to throw on the jacket. But if, you, if you're not someone that wears pants, then you might want the full suit so you don't have to go and find pants each time you go beekeeping. <laughs> so, good, good question. This hive seems to be pretty friendly. One of the questions is, how do you know when you're purchasing bees and queens from a bee um, beekeeper that they are going to be friendly, or do you know? You don't know for sure, but generally beekeepers will breed friendly bees. That's what they do. They know what they're doing. And if you're purchasing them from somebody who's an experienced breeder, they'll be able to give you a, a nice gentle colony, especially if you request it. So, uh, but if you're taking a split from somebody and letting them raise their own, they could mate with the rascal drones from down the road and you might get all sorts of um, genetics in there, which could have more aggression or they could be gentle. It's just a bit of a wild card then. Great, Terry's asking, this is a bit of a long question, um, her mentor has gone missing in action and thought she'd speak to the bee's knees, so to speak, as in you. Um, the configuration that she's got, they've got a brood box, a flow box and two ideal boxes. The, the bees just seem to be bypassing her, um, the flow and going up to the ideal. Any tips to entice them back into the flow super? Okay, so what I always advise is start in this configuration you see here and wait till they've actually started to use the flow frames before adding on any more boxes. That way they'll start to use them. Once they've waxed them for the first time, then they should treat them like any other beehive uh, frame. And, uh, but if you go adding more boxes to start with, it will slow down the process of them starting to use the flow frames for the first time and uh, you might get a bit impatient there. So what I'd recommend there is uh, take off the ideals, let them get going on the flow frames, let them, let them half fill them up at least before you're putting on extra boxes. Great, Zeta, and in doing that, um, because I think that's what Terry was thinking, in doing that, would you just then shake the bees off the ideal, leave it by the hive and wait for them to all go back into the brood and the super box? Yes, you can. You can just shake them in front of the hive or you could shake them directly into the hive. I'll show you how to do a shake right now. Oh, so great. when you're shaking brood frames, you do have to be a little bit careful though, because if you've got a queen cell on there, you could dislodge that queen cell, uh, that, that brood in that queen cup. Uh, sorry, the larvae in the queen cup. And so just do a quick check before you're shaking frames that you don't have queen cells. So here we have a frame. This one's a bit stronger, it's connected to the walls, doesn't have wire, it's all naturally drawn in this box by the look of it. You've got a bit of brood on there. And in order to get a good look at that brood, I'm already seeing it's a little bit patchy, so when you see patchy brood, it's a good idea to really tune in on it to make sure you haven't got any signs of AFB or EFB. But getting back to your question, to shake bees off a frame, you can either shake them out the front as you say, but if the queen's on there, which it won't be if you're shaking your ideals because they're up, up the top there away from the brood nest. But if you are shaking brood frames, then um, you're best off shaking them over the top of the box because if the queen's on there, you want her to drop back into the hive. She can be a bit helpless and not make it back in if you shake her out the front. 
So beautiful pollen on this frame. So to, to shake bees off a frame, you need most movements in beekeeping are nice and gentle so to, to, to calm the bees, but getting bees off a frame, you uh, shake them like this. And now you see most of the bees are gone off the frame. So you can really get a good look at this brood and do your inspections. And the bees, a lot of them fell into there and others went into the air. So that's a typical way just to shake them off. Now what we're doing is looking in on this brood. Now it might be easier if we just look in the shade here and have a good look at what's going on. Um, just for the camera, the shade, but otherwise it's actually a lot easier for your eyes to, to view in the sun. Now I'm seeing a bit of a checkered brood pattern, so I'm dialing in on that to make sure I'm not seeing any sunken dark cappings with piercings, and that's a sign of AFB or EFB. If you do, you've got to do the rope test, which is getting a matchstick or something similar and poking it in, and if it comes out all stringy and goopy like, uh, like mucus, then you've got a problem you need to deal with. Now, if you uh, have a look here, what I'm seeing is young larvae down the cells. So it looks like they're just between uh, laying more. So that actually looks quite good. Up here you've got, got pollen, see these beautiful orange tones down the cells. Then you've got the larvae glistening white here. And then you've got some cap brood. So uh, that actually looks all okay. But a good thing to go through your frame and check and get used to what uh, pests and diseases look like. On this other side, we've got an amazing amount of pollen. Check this out. Th through this section here, you've got all of this bee bread, all different colours of oranges and yellows. And isn't that magical? Making their bee bread. So there's some nice pollen stores. And it's said that to raise one whole frame of brood they need a frame of pollen and a frame of honey so you can see why they need so much stores. Keep the questions coming in. So to how much honey, I'm not sure Amy's asking the question, not sure where they're coming in from, but just for how much honey should they leave in the super for winter? So that really does depend where you are in the world. Here we don't really have much of a winter, in fact we can keep harvesting all through the winter and it's really other times of year that, that we run out of nectar. But even then we can just about harvest a little bit all year round if the honey is there. Other areas like down south here in Australia, up north there in, in North America or in Europe where you have long cold snowy winters, you might need to leave them a a whole box of honey to survive the winter and in some extreme cases two boxes. Get some advice from your local beekeepers. The idea is to in those areas is to go through your overwintering and come out the other side with a colony that hasn't run out of food and if it's likely that they're going to look like they're going to run out then you will need to feed them some uh, sugar syrup to tide them over and get them through till the next spring when the flowers start blooming again. Right. Uh, Tizza, who joins us most weeks, is just wondering why do bees beard? I hope you understood that with my Kiwi accent there. Beard. <laughs> are the bees having beer? Yeah. <laughs> bees are having beard. They're bearding. And just they was it a bear? Been... <laughs> it's not a, is there a bear in there? I'm wondering <laughs> why your hive's been doing it for the last few days. What's, what's the go with the bearding bees? So it's a great sign of a healthy hive with lots of numbers. Now you can get into the situation where your bees are bearding because they want to swarm. Or it's a, one sign of swarming is this, the bee beard hanging right down off the landing board. How accurate it is, um, it's hard to know, but bees will beard just when they've got a, a real abundance of bees in their hive. When you open the side windows, you can hardly see the frames and they can't ventilate like that. So they have to beard out the front um, in order to provide enough space to get the airflow required to continue their air conditioning in the hive, to get the moisture levels right, to keep drawing their honey and keep the temperature right for the brood. So. Um, it's normal with a healthy hive, especially on those hot days, to, to see a bit of a bee beard out the front. And in some cases, it starts to extend all the way up the front of the hive and all the way down. Now, if you're in the springtime, it's likely if they're that jam-packed with bees that they will swarm. So you want to get in there and take your splits and uh, make more hives, make space in the brood nest to limit the swarming tendency. But if it's not swarm season, it's probably unlikely they're going to swarm and you can just let them 
beard and they will start to reduce the amount of eggs they lay uh, in the hive and the numbers will naturally drop with the nectar as the nectar flows uh, wanes. Great. Uh, Barbara from Yak and Danda, I just had to say that, um, is wondering, can you remove the plug from the roof during summer and put wire netting in its place? Uh, you could, although all my attempts at doing top ventilation haven't got the tick from the bees. The bees tend to stop top ventilation, I've found. And I think it's because the bees, if they have a cover on the top, they can fan and control the temperature inside. But if you take the top off the hive, they, it's a lot harder for them to control the temperature because the, the, the warm air just escapes straight out the top. So I've found when I do vents in the top, they just block them up. But uh, other beekeepers do like to do vents in the top, so you can see what wor works for you there. What I would suggest is bottom ventilation. That gives the bees the ability to control it by fanning and creating a cycle of air up and down. Now, what happens is the air goes in, it collects a bit of humidity, which makes it heavier. So as they dry the honey, the air takes on more moisture, and then it it falls down and out like this. So they've got this beautiful cycle that goes on. So if you, it is really hot and you want to give your bees lots of ventilation, then just take out this, if you've got a screen bottom board, then take out the tray altogether and that will provide a lot of ventilation for them to continue to create that cycle. Right, Chuck's wondering, Cedar, um, is it okay to have one full brood box to put on the flow frames or should they wait for two brood boxes as some suggest? I would just go with one full brood box then your flow frames get them used to the the flow frames get them producing some honey and then put another brood box if you go for two brood boxes and uh, then your flow frames. You'll be waiting a long time till they have enough numbers and then coincides with the nectar flow in order for them to start on the flow frames. You'll likely get quite impatient and write to us all the time. You're better, you're better off just putting your flow frames right on top in this configuration, get them started, and then if you want to add more boxes, add it after they've already started to fill at least some of the flow frames with honey. Right, Louis called in from uh, Melbourne where it's a bit cold down there at the moment and they've had lots of rain. Got a 10 frame brood box. Just wondering how many frames should they expect to have nectar and capped honey before they need to feed the bees sugar syrup? Okay, so this time of year you should still have lots of flowers around, but if, you, if you're not getting any stores um, closer to the winter then you should start to feed them so you've uh, you've got stores at least some good stores in your area in the brood box so the uh, frames on the edges are full of honey not just dry and that way they've got something to chew on over over the winter um, some beekeepers might suggest you have another box uh, full of honey as well to survive that winter time fantastic Suzanne's asking um, Bit of a question about the flow frames, and I know we get this quite a lot, it's a very popular customer support question. Just swap them out for a while, cleaned them, and have put them back in the hive, and has closed the cells, but they don't seem to be aligned vertically. Um, for example, the face is not flat, but very rigid, and the bees are not using them. Just wondering what to do, do they need new frames, or is it just that they are closed and it just doesn't look flat from the outside? Okay, so there's a couple of things there. You'll notice there's a step in our flow frame. So in the surface, it's normal whether they're closed or open. If you're looking in the side window in this direction, it'll step in, go long, step out each cell line like this. So that's normal. And the idea there is that the bees um, are completing that comb and the movement is happening deeper beneath their feet, so less disturbance on the capping. Now, there's another alignment and that's this way. So if you're looking in your side window and you see that the hexagons aren't making hexagons, that's a hexagon that's sitting up a bit, then that is an issue. So if you're seeing that, then um, the first thing I'll try to do, if it's already in the hive and the bees are working it, is put a key in the top and turn it and see if they, they uh, return to that position. 
If they don't and they're still sitting up, then leave the key in there for a few days. Uh, you might want to, um, sometimes if the bees are hungry, they, they might go and get down the area where the key's going in, so you could put stuff something in there to stop the bees getting in. But basically leave a key, or even two keys in there, just to push those parts down. If that still doesn't work, and your frames are stuck in that position, then what you'll need to do is remove that frame and put it in, put it in the sun, ideally in a black plastic bag after shaking the bees off, and leave a key in the top, and as it warms up, all the parts will uh, seat back down into their correct position. That issue usually comes from not doing a good enough close after harvesting, and the parts are sitting up a bit like that, and then they get waxed in that position. It's a good idea to remember to turn the key to close the frames and wait 30 seconds or so just for all of those parts to move back into position. There, are, there is other tips and tricks as well, like um, it, if you're impatient, you don't want to put the hive in the sun, you can just um, slide something like this down or a butter knife's probably better between the cell lines at the bottom and that will loosen it up and with the key in the top, allow it to move back into the position as well. So a few tips there for you to try. But just have a close look and look on the angle that the cells are. The cells are on a 13 degree angle, so you're looking down like that. If you're seeing hexagons, then it's good. If you're seeing that they're out like that, then you'll need to fix it. Great, thanks Ada. Great tip there. Um, question, how long does it usually take to fill a flow frame? That's the million dollar question. So, uh, once the bees are into it, sometimes that can take a while, depending on whether the stars align with a good nectar flow and the colony that's nice and healthy like this. Uh, and then it happens really quickly, especially if you've got that nectar flow, they'll get in there. But sometimes on the other extreme, you can go through a whole season where they don't even store any honey. And that can happen in a conventional beehive or a flow beehive. And so you can sometimes need to exercise a bit of patience till you've got the bee numbers and you've got a good nectar flow. Then typically, once they start filling, they'll, they'll fill them quite quickly. And in the springtime, when you've typically got lots of nectar, you'll even find you can harvest them and they'll fill them up again in a week or two again. And that, it's really exciting when you get to that point where your bees are really healthy, the nectar flow's good, and you're harvesting lots of honey and storing it and giving it away. And uh, yeah, so a bit of patience to get you there. <laughs> patience, very good. Cedar Warwick is asking, if, if, he does, if they do a split on a new, can they put it on top of another hive? It's just that they've run out of room on their veranda. So I'm thinking it's taking a split from a new onto another hive that they've already got. Yes, you absolutely can. That's one of the ways I used to split hives, do, doing beekeeping conventionally, when they're all in a row in more of a commercial outfit. Typically, uh, um, there's all sorts of ways to do splits, but one is, as you say, you can just put it on top. So you leave your inner cover as a divider board, and then bees don't care whether it's the splits to the side or above. You can create a split right on top. Some people like to point their entrances different ways, but on your balcony you probably just want to point them the same way. Uh, so they're not flying in the wrong direction towards your house. <laughs> See, the Stephen's asking, a bit like what you were talking about before with the roof, do I need to cap my roof as the bees have all, are building comb in the ceiling? They must have a classic, maybe? So it's up to you. Now I find I just leave the plugs in because I'm sick of harvesting honeycomb out of the roof. But some people like to do that. I like to build up a bit of honeycomb in there and harvest that and use the wax for candles and things like that. Uh, but um, it is a bit messy. If you want to contain them a bit more, you can give them a limited space by using perhaps one of those Pyrex baking dishes so you can pop the roof off and just have a look at how they're building in there. Um, but yeah, otherwise just put your plug in and that way they won't have access to that roof area. Here we've got some very nice looking brood on this side, actually on both sides. Have a look here. We've got, um, we've got drones here, these big teddy bear looking bees, quite a lot of drones actually. 
and we've got a whole lot of brood through here. It's nice when you've got a lot of brood in a frame. And this is one that's been put in in springtime for spring management. They've drawn it out and they're starting to use it. So some of these cells are being used for probably maybe a second or third time by the look of it as they cycle through their brood cycles in the frames. And each time the frames get darker and that's why the, the one down here you see has very dark older wax and this one has fresh light yellow wax. So we've definitely got a good laying queen in there. Everything's looking good. You don't have to find the queen, but I'm keeping a lookout for her because it's fun to train your eyes for spotting queens. As people get started, they often think the drones are queens, but you can see they're a big fat bodied, sort of more dumpy shape with the, with the eyes that touch in the middle. The, the queen's more uh, got a pointy abdomen at the back. Cedar, so, with um, the, the brood frames, like you were just saying, that looks like a fresh one and the other one is quite dark. Do you ever need to replace those frames or do you just leave the same brood frames in your hive for years and years? So if you're doing naturally drawn comb like this, what you do is just uh, get your hive tool or a kitchen knife, shake all the bees off and cut out the old, old um, frame. Now you wouldn't do it when there's brood in there, you'd put this close to the edge, let it all emerge and then cut it out and then the bees can just draw new comb again. So once you cut it out, put it back towards the centre and you get a cycle like that. Each springtime you can cycle a few frames out. If you're going wax and wired, you'll have to pre-prepare your frame with wire and foundation and swap it and then take the old one away for processing. And Cedar, so how often would you recommend doing that? Or is it up so to you? So in the springtime, it's good to cycle a couple out because that also does your spring management and uh, it limits the swarming triggers. Fresh new space for the queen to lay means she's less likely um, to swarm. Right. Gorik has questioned, new to beekeeping, and did a split um, from the, um, their dad about three weeks ago and has already had a small swarm. Just wondering, did this happen because maybe there were potentially two queens? So, uh, it can happen. Um, it, that's a hard one to answer, but basically, um, it's a little bit unfortunate if you're getting swarmed straight away again. So sometimes you can get into a situation where there is multiple queens in the hive and they're doing funny things. But um, it also could be that um, you just got a bit of unlucky, unlucky with the genetics there and you've got some swarmy ones. If they continue to do that, then you might actually want to introduce a new queen from a queen breeder to um, get back to some genetics that are that are more uh, stay and play and make the honey. Cedar, what are your thoughts on, um, I'm not, I hope I'm saying this right, the Aposolis vape smoker rather than the standard smoker? I haven't used it, but if you have used it, put your comments in below and let us know how it is. It isn't it? Um, Naomi's wondering, I'm not sure where Naomi's um, tuned in from, I'm just wondering is there a pause in the honey flow right now? A local beekeeper told um, them a few months ago that there's a drought. Look at these bees festooning, they're joining their legs and, and uh, this is like a three way join between their feet, they're locking in together. That's what they do when they're, it's like scaffolding to create their wax. They've decided they want to do some extra wax down here in this corner and they're, they're making the scaffolding and who knows what, it's amazing that they can make comb at all. If, if you think about it, one bee might contribute just a small part of one cell and somehow another bee comes along and adds onto it and they're able to, to really create their comb. Um, so yeah, that's uh, an incredible thing. Um, just remind me of that question quickly. Yeah, Naomi was just wondering that they'd heard, wondering if there was a flow on now. Uh, uh, they'd yes. been told by some beekeepers that there was perhaps a drought on. So things ebb and flow in this area, they pulse. So here we are, and uh, there's not much nectar. You can see, by the way, there's none in the top. Typically, you have a bit of honey around the top here, but they've stripped all that and used it to raise their young. So you can say there's not a flow on at the moment. It's called a, a, a dearth and 
that means um, you've got to wait a while before there is a bit more nectar around. It's typical in the late summer here, or midsummer as we are, to get a bit of a, a, a drought from the honey in this area. If you go an hour's drive inland, it's the opposite, you'll probably get a whole lot of honey this time of year. So it really is quite localised and it just changes with the seasons. So it's a wonderful thing to tune in with it and it'll be different each season as well. So uh, sometimes like the iron bark at my place didn't flower this year, which is a shame because they're the predominant tree and I have never seen them not flower, so that's new. Well. Okay. Now, if you've got questions, put them in the comments. We're doing a bit of beekeeping here, going to a brood inspection. We're looking out for pests and disease. The idea would be at least a couple of times a year, you're getting through all your frames, checking for signs of AFB, which would be sunken dark cappings with piercings in them. Now, if you see that, you'll need to do what's called the rope test, get a little matchstick, poke it down there. If it comes out all gooey and ropey like uh, mucus, then you've got a problem you'll need to, to fix. Uh, but it's a, a good thing to be constantly on the lookout for as you go through your hive. Here we don't have the Varroa mite, so in other continents you're going to be doing uh, different sorts of management for those annoying little Varroa mites. <laughs> and actually, Cedar, that was one of the questions, was how often through spring and summer would you inspect your hives? So look, for me it really depends. Um, I, like to make sure I get through the brood nest at least a couple of times in the season, but uh, it's also on an ads needs basis. So if you see the numbers dropping, get in there and have a look before it's, before it's gone hopelessly queenless or something like that. You wanna make sure they've got a laying queen. The longer you leave it, the harder it is to rectify the problem. It, it gets called hopelessly queenless if they've been queenless for month and the months and the population is dwindling away. And then they actually get resistant to accepting a new one. So it gets a bit tricky at that point. Um, so if you see the numbers declining or something else like a whole lot of hive beetle larvae dropping down in your tray, then get in there and have a look, make sure things are okay. Right. Cedar, um, our bee detectives are on the case again and Neil just noticed that when you pulled out one of the frames there was maybe a queen cell and just wondering is that um, of a concern that there's a queen cell in there? Okay, well done. So I did see a little queen cup somewhere. Um, it didn't look like it was a queen cell, so it must have been on one of these frames. I'm looking around here to have a look. I can't see one on here. The, a queen cell typically looks like a peanut uh, uh, on the comb surface. So c because queens are bigger, they, they have to build them out and hanging down a bit. So the cells are quite easy to spot. The cups are a bit harder because they're just a little tiny cup in the start of a queen cell. So I'm not seeing it on that one. And also, Cedar, while you're looking, Matt also thought that they'd spotted um, an uncapped cell with maybe a, a, a dead white bee in it. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, the detectives are on the case this morning. Yeah, that's great. It's yeah. great having people tuning in on their bees and, and really noticing, because that's what it's all about. And I'm still learning a lot about bees. So it's um, very cool to be able to do something where there's a continuing learning journey with it. Uh, so I'm not um, seeing a queen cell on this one. I can see larvae down the cells, but it's still in the grub phase. But occasionally you do get this funny thing where you can see the eyes of a bee down the cell and they're still white. And it, either the bees have chewed away the capping, perhaps they think there's something wrong with those cells, or perhaps there's um, an issue like chalk brood and you've got a chalky mummy down the cell. Um, but yeah, well noticed. Okay, keep the questions coming in. Okay, Cedar, this, um, this is a good question. Do bees in a new colony get a little more aggressive as they start getting more crowded? Is that a sign that extra space should soon be added? The, well, as the numbers increase, they do, uh, if they do have aggressive traits, then they'll just be a bit more of it. That's probably the way I would put it. 
Whereas if you have a calm hive and as it gets bigger, then they will be uh, still relatively calm. Um, but often a hive that's only got a couple of little frames are usually pretty gentle, even if they've got aggressive traits that have come out as they build. Um, but not always, sometimes you can get just a couple of frames in a nuke and they're grumpy. So, so it all depends on the genetics. So the Pauline's asking, set up the hive this year, um, middle of February, just wait, still waiting for their first harvest. But just noticed from the side window, they can see some capping happening, but also noticing some big, big bees, dark in colour, black. Are these drones and should they be in the super? Okay, um, if have a look um, at the difference between drones and workers, just Google that one, and here you can see them here. The difference is the drones are big teddy bear shaped with eyes that touch in the middle, and the workers are a bit more, a bit more slender. So if you're seeing drones in the top and you have an excluder in place, it could be the cat, there could be a few things going on. There, there might be a situation where there is eggs being laid in the flow frames that are unfertilized by the workers and they can only turn into drones. And if that's happening, it means your hive doesn't have a queen below. So you'll need to get in there and sort that out and make sure you're introducing a new queen before the hive dwindles away. Um, another thing that could be ha happen happening is the queen somehow got through the excluder perhaps when she was uh, very um, small still can happen sometimes and she's actually laying in the flow frames so inspect your flow frames and have a look for that as well and um, if you can't see anything amiss like that or regardless either way if there is um, a queen laying in your flow frames you'll need to shake all the bees off the flow frames put your excluder back in place and then put the flow frames back on and that way all the workers will come up through the excluder, leave the um, drones and the queen behind underneath where she should be down in the brood box. Great. So the Adrian's just asking, just one of the flow frames just started leaking a little bit of honey today out the bottom where you normally harvest. Just it's cleaned it all up but just wondering should they be concerned about that? Okay, that happens if that little leak back point we've designed um, you can have a look over here, come, come and have a look so you know what we're talking about here. Oops. Um, so, I don't know if you can see, but right there at the bottom is a little point we've designed so any honey that builds up will go back to the bees. Now the bees will block that up, so what you'll need to do is take your cap out and unblock that little area there, and that way any remaining honey can go back to the bees. If it's built up for a while, it's been sitting there, just check it's not fermented by tasting it. If it is, does taste fermented, just put a tube in there and drain that away. Don't let the bees get to that. And, uh, that will, and then when you put your cap back in, that area will be clean and anything that does dribble through, which sometimes happens with flow frames, sometimes doesn't, um, but any dribbles that go through will just go back to the bees to reuse. See, so Jodie's got the uh, hive under a tree. Should it be out in the open? Uh, it's up to you. If you've got the ability to do a, particularly some afternoon shade in summer, that's a wonderful thing. If it's shady all year round, I would move it a little bit so it gets a bit of sun, especially uh, in the mornings. That just helps with uh, pathogens like chalk brood. You find if, you, if your hive's in a damp, shady spot, um, then you could get chalk brood issues in your hive. Generally, bees can handle full sun or full shade. So um, if you don't have the ability to do that, then your bees will most likely be okay. Here we've chosen for full sun, but um, they do get hot in the summer like that. So a bit of afternoon shade, particularly in the summer, would be ideal. Right, and Stephen's wondering, um, obviously we're on the far north coast, just wondering which way our hives are facing here. So they're facing east towards the ocean here. and. It's not, um, you can face them any way you like basically. Commercial beekeepers will often face them towards the morning light so that they'll get up and working earlier to get that little bit of extra production. But it's, uh, it's really a small amount of extra increase 
um, in production. So as a home beekeeper, it's probably, there's gonna be other factors that will affect which way you face your hive, like the flight path, making sure it's not bothering you, or pets and things like that. Great, um, Catherine had a bit of a, some cranky bees. Um, she got stung on the ear, her husband got stung on the eye, it was all, but they had been liquid feeding their orchard and using like fish and seaweed fertiliser. Just wondering if you think that would have any effect to change the, the turning the bees grumpy. Mm. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> sometimes um, bees can respond to the environment and get grumpy. There's some nectars that are said to do that. Um, so I'm not sure on that one. It'd be interesting. Let us know how it goes once you've stopped liquid feeding to see whether they return to being less grumpy. Yeah. <laughs> um, Sarah Rose is asking, if you do find extra queens in your hive, what do you do with them? So there's a bit of a, uh, generally we just let the bees work it out, um, especially if you're new to beekeeping. But experienced beekeepers will um, sometimes tear down queen cells uh, to limit swarming. And also some beekeepers will take the opportunity to make a split if they see extra queen cells on frames. If you've got um, two bees in there and one of them's a virgin, then they'll fight to the death and then there'll be one queen. Is typically how it goes. Um, but you can get a, a strange case where you've got two mated queens in a hive and some people actually try and um, get their hive uh, to do that so they've got two laying queens by separating them far enough but being in the same hive with a, an excluder in between them. So two queens is possible but normally the bees will sort that out. They're clever at sorting themselves out, aren't they? So here we've got drone cells. There was a question about drones earlier. And here on this frame, you've got a really good um, view of what drone cells look like compared to queen, uh, worker cells. So here you've got um, worker cells, see in this, this area here. And down here, you've got drone cells that stick out from the frame of um, bullet shape, it gets called. And they're a bit bigger because the drones are bigger. See, the question coming in about the brood frames, um, how long could you leave these frames outside the hive without them being affected? That's a, a good question. So on a day like today, it's nice and warm here. We could leave them out for a long time, all day, and, and the brood would be fine. But if you're in a cold environment, then don't leave your brood out long because uncapped brood can get chilled and die. Cedar, Johnny wants to know, are we going to be doing Q&A over the Christmas period? Uh, we probably will. Um, there probably will be a, uh, a break. I won't have my team here to, um, to do it. Um, so uh, we'll let you know about that. Fantastic. People, of course, asking, wanting to show the Queen, but I don't think we've spotted her yet. We haven't spotted the Queen, but I haven't really particularly been um, looking. I've been a bit distracted, so I'll, I'll see if I can find her for you. OK. We've got time for a few more questions. Oh, um, Genevieve's asking and wanted to know Cedar's opinion about reversing boxes, more the second box to the bottom in the spring. Ah, that's an interesting one. So um, if you mean putting the brood box on top and the flow box underneath, it is something I've tried. I haven't had great success. It seems bees are slightly less enthusiastic to store honey, but um, I haven't tried it for a while and uh, perhaps um, that could be a really good way because you can easily check your brood and you don't need to check your flow frames so much. So try it, see if it works. <laughs> uh, and, um, but otherwise, if you meant just mixing boxes around, if you're adding another brood box, then underneath is the way to go. So if you are drawing naturally comb, they will um, then draw it hanging down rather than uh, trying to build it up 
from the brood box and it going all wonky. So do you know of any birds that will eat the bees? Yes, we have the rainbow bee eater here that um, gets around at, some, at a certain time of year and enjoys feasting on bees. And we also have the pheasant cookout, which is a, a big uh, bird from the nightjar family. And it actually uh, enjoys eating bees as well. So we've got a few types here, but I'm sure there's lots of other uh, bee eating birds around, but it's kind of fair's fair, I figure. I mean, if you consider that the queen can lay a few thousand eggs a day, your hive can spare a few bees to those um, birds who have taken so much habitat away, they probably need a bit of a feed. Right, Cedar so Jody's asking, replace the old queen yesterday, but found quite a few hive beetle larvae that weren't there four days ago. Just wondering, is their hive doomed? Oh, so if you're finding a lot of hive beetle larvae uh, falling into the tray, sometimes you can actually get them, um, if it's mucky down there, laying in the tray and you can get larvae, but if it's falling down from the frames, then you need to get in there and fix that. And the way you fix that, um, and, and the sooner the better with this, because they can really uh, move quite quickly and make a mess. Uh, it's, what you'll need to do is take away all of the pollen and honey stores and reduce them to just a few frames in the center. And that'll give them the most chance of being able to really look after all of those frame surfaces and keep the beetles under check. So you can do that by um, just taking the frames away or you cut that, that the uh, wax out so you shake off the, um, the bees, you cut out the wax and pollen and then um, put the frames back in empty. Now, yeah, and you'll take the, the, probably take the super off as well. That's if you've got a, an infestation that looks like it's about to take over. And I've, I've been able to use that to rescue a colony a few times. But if it's just a mild infection, you've just got a, a few dripping down, you can't really see but um, the frame's getting all slimy with um, hive beetles yet. You might just want to use your tray in the bottom here to put some oil in there and catch some of those beetles. So the tray in the bottom there, put some oil in there and you can catch some of those hive beetles. And it works quite well for that purpose. Right, um, just letting everyone know too, there's quite a few questions coming in on what's available, where we ship to and things like that, just so you know customer support will answer those questions for you, so, so don't worry, we won't forget you. Um, and see, this is, a, this is such a beautiful image, this morning um, they spotted a row of bees on the landing board with their behinds facing outward and they were just lined up fanning their wings with their backside facing the sun. Just wondering, what were they doing? <laughs> so, <laughs> Such so, a beautiful image. So, so there's a few things they do uh, when they're fanning like that. One, if you see, if, if you look really closely and you see the very end of their tail lifted, then what they're doing, well actually not lifted, it's like kind of kinked a little bit and they'll be exposing a gland called the Nazanoff gland. And they'll do that if they want to fan some of their pheromone to say, hey, this is my hive, it's over here, come, uh, come back here to the hive. Now, there's other reasons too, it could have been just ventilation, they'll be buzzing away, creating some airflow to do their bee air conditioning. So um, it's probably one of those depending on what's happening on the tip of their abdomen. What do you think these ones are doing, Cedar? Okay, so we're looking at these ones fanning here, they're going for airflow, you see that they're, um, they're have, they haven't, their tail should be raised with a kink right at the end if it's the Nazanoff gland fanning. But these ones are just doing it for airflow, you can see here. And probably because we've blown a bunch of smoke into the hive and they're like, hang on a second, we need to get the air conditioning turned on here and blow that smoke out. Fantastic. Um, Cedar, if I, I think the question here, this is from Genevieve, what if you have two boxes under the Flow Super? I'm thinking they're thinking maybe two brood boxes to inspect? Yes, one of the reasons why I like one brood box is simply it's easier to manage. You don't have to go through two brood boxes to look for the queen if you're looking for her and so on. So, but nevertheless, some people like to keep multiple brood boxes and that's a good thing to do as well but management will be a bit harder with 
going through twice as many frames when you do your brood inspections. Here you've got some interesting waggle dances happening. The bees are communicating. I can't quite decode this one here. It could just be a come and groom me dance um, because she doesn't seem to be uh, walking around in a figure of eight or a round dance. It's just shaking every now and then. Just see the shake she's doing. So we're yet to learn a lot about bees communication, but they'll do all sorts of dances depending on what they're trying to communicate. Very cool. So good. So then this is just notice obviously we have a lot of plants in our garden here quite close to the hive. How are we preventing the ants from getting into our hive? Well we're not at the moment. The ants aren't too bad at the moment so we're just letting them go but if the ants got really bad they're behind all of the covers and we're getting annoyed with it we would cut the foliage away back from the hive and uh, put some oil or grease in our ant traps and limit them. But ants seem to ebb and flow a little bit and right now they're not really causing us any grief so I'm not doing anything about it. Okay. Oh. Here we go. Some more good brood on this frame. Look at that. Very nice. Lots of bees waiting to emerge there. Got some waggle dancers. Yeah, look at that one. Just here. Got one. It doesn't seem to be particularly ordered either, so that could be a grooming dance. Another one there. That one's going circular. Oh, it was. If it was if it's doing a circular dance it means the forage is very close by. If it's a figure of eight, then the axis of the figure of eight uh, will tell you the the direction according to the sun of the to to the flowers. And one second of waggle on the tail and then a pause is close to a kilometre in distance. Amazing. So Edward, if you've done a split from one hive to another, so you've got now got two hives but they're from the original hive, can you mix those frames between them without having to worry about spreading diseases if they all originally came from the same hive? I guess if you've done it uh, relatively recently then as you say it's um, you're only risking what you've already risked and that's sharing pathogens between the two hives so uh, I wouldn't be too worried about that in that case. Here we have a queen cup. Someone had a question about that earlier and you see that shape there. It's not a queen cell yet. It's called a queen cup because they haven't drawn it into the full long peanut cell shape. They've uh, just cupped it a bit. Now if there is an egg in there then they'll add to that cell and turn it into a big long queen cell. Just to get these bees away and I'm going to have a look down the cell and look to see if I can see it's dry so it's just a spare queen cup just in case they should need it. Um, they're not actually raising a queen. So some people would knock them off. Yeah, I just saw it too. Did you spot it? She's oh, marked yes. this queen with a blue mark, so that makes it easier. Oh. Well done, Stone. Uh, so somebody asked about the queen earlier. There she is. Yeah. Now, she's a marked queen, which means she's got a paint dob on the back of her thorax there to help with spotting. It also helps her colour code for each year. Uh, and then you can get an idea of how long your queen's been in the hive for. How long will that queen live for, Suda? She could live up to six years. Beekeepers will typically, uh, if they're going for peak honey production, they'll be replacing them every couple of years to just really make sure we're getting, getting enough egg laying going on. But as a backyard beekeeper, well, there she goes, down the <laughs> cell to lay an egg. Look at that. She's just placed her abdomen deep down a cell, she's popping off an egg. So she's uh, inspected the cell um, and she smelled the pheromone that the workers deposit to say it's clean and ready to go, a bit like the door hanger on a hotel room. Then she's uh, dipped her abdomen down the cell and deposited an egg right at the bottom. Well done. 
Wow, Mira, Mira will be wishing she was here with her little camera. <laughs> yeah, Mira gets amazing footage of all of this kind of thing. That's my sister. She's uh, totally um, mad about the, the bees and filming them all. There she goes again, down the cell. Now the other bees are crowding around to get in on the action. Yeah, what are they doing? But um, probably disturbing her work there, but it looks like she's going to go again. You can see the egg on her the tip of her tail there. Wow. Not sure if you can see that, yep. but it's probably because I disturbed her <laughs> midway. And now she's like, hey, get out of here. I've got my egg to put somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> ah, very cool. Wow. Okay, so I'm going to gently put that frame back in and we've got time for a couple more questions as I close this hive up. Great. So with that blue mark on the queen, is it a particular sort of paint or ink or is there like bee paint? You can buy special queen marking pens, uh, but generally it's a paint marker pen. Okay. So do any thoughts on using um, fiberglass resin to waterproof and seal the hive? Okay, give it a go I'd say if you really want to do that. Um, you have to do a really good job is all I can say, a bit like a boat, if there's any cracks in it then the water gets in you get that kind of mould underneath the resin and then it's a bit harder to, to clean that up because you can't simply sand it. So. Um, you'd have to do a pretty good job probably inside and out to resin your boxes in order to get um, no water sort of in under the glass. And getting some good feedback, Stone, who's our camera person here today, saying awesome shots coming through. So that's always good. Stone is balancing on a garden bed. I'm amazed. Oh, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> Doing a great job. <laughs> so to, to catch and mark the Queen, do you have to do it? They'd, I think people are saying, like, can you just find it and then mark it, or should it be done before the queen gets into the hive? Oh, you can catch her and mark her for sure. So that they even make these special little things for that purpose that go over the top of the queen, not enough to squash her, but just holds her because it's the right distance. And then you put the little mark on her uh, thorax and let her go again. Incredible. Okay. <clears throat> Let's close this up now. I'm trying to remember which frame went where. <laughs> I was wondering how you were going to do if that. If they're nice and straight, it doesn't matter, but if there's bulgy bits, you just don't want bulgy bits uh, touching each other because that's where the, the bees will have to work hard to clear away all the wax again and, um, and the hive beetles can really use those areas where the bees can't get to them if there's two frames touching each other. So I'm looking at the little bits of wax to get an idea of which frame went where and that bird comb can often just tell you which way the frames went back in if you've uh, forgotten. Just on that fibreglass um, question, Cedar, because we're going through a couple of different platforms, I'm not sure if the previous uh, person will see this answer, but Matt tried the fibreglass resin, but three years on it's not looking so good. So okay, there's a bit of feedback there's there. There's a bit of feedback for you. Yeah, there's a few people who have tried it. I haven't heard a great long-lasting result from it, but um, there could be um, reasons for that, and perhaps somebody will succeed nicely. Now, I just noticed they just started going for my hands again. I haven't had the smoker going for a long time now. So um, I might just get it going again. I'm going to do that just by uh, adding a bit more fuel to the top. Bearing in mind it's quite hot at this point, so you can use your hive tool to open it up. I'm just going to throw in a bit more garden mulch like this, being careful not to touch the uh, hot metal and away it'll go again and that'll uh, then just get us through with the close up. Oh, that felt like I burnt myself, but it was actually a sting from a bee. So there's the stinger there, just on the end of my thumb. You probably need a macro to see that, but um, that bee uh, just stung me. So right on cue, I was just saying, uh, getting a little more antsy. We've um, had them part a long time and we we forgot about the smoker altogether for a while there, so let's get it going again. Calm them down. You can put on your gloves at this point, would be another thing to do. Uh, get your smoker going again. 
see the, the mulch you've just taken off there. Um, what mulch are you using and does it matter what you use? It doesn't really matter. If you've got nothing else, just use some paper and cardboard. I prefer to use natural things. They just smell better and it, it probably, you know, you can imagine in cardboard and things, there might be glues and things you want to avoid. But if you've got nothing else, you can use a bit of paper. Um, pine needles are great. They have a nice smell to them. They're really easy to light. Um, garden, this is um, organic sugar cane mulch we use for the garden. And, uh, but whatever you've got around, if you've just got leaves, use leaves. If you, uh, some people ho hang an old hessian sack on the fence for, for six months and then they'd say that's the perfect smoker material. Other people use bark from various trees. For me, it's just whatever you've got handy. Yeah. And see, so to the type of bees that we've got here today, they seem pretty gentle and, and golden. What sort of bees are they? So the golden gentle ones generally get called the golden Italians. So the Italian bee and some um, bee breeders will call them golden Italians. The darker ones generally are the Caucasians uh, and there's all sorts of other breeds like Carnolians and things that are all said to have different traits and each breeder will have their favourites and what they like to, to breed. Um, they're all good and generally um, if you do want a nice calm hive, then just ask for a nice calm one to get going. It'll make it easier as you get going in beekeeping. Great, um, some feedback on what to use in the smoker. We've got someone who uses the long needles from a pine nut tree. Ah, oh, great. It gives a nice fragrance as well. Yes, yeah, pine needles are great. Yeah. Um, I wish we had the pine nut tree here oh. if we could get some good pine nuts for our salad. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> We've actually got, in Australia, we've got these ones called the bunya pine, which have a nut about that big. And the pine cone itself will kill you if it falls on you. It's like this big spiky thing, this big. And um, so you've got to be careful under those trees. It's called the bunya nut. And uh, the bunya mountains are not so far from here, where um, the indigenous actually had big festivals because there was so, so plentiful, those big pine nuts. Uh, great eating and uh, each year I go collecting them and I'll roast them in the in the ashes of a fire and they're, they're beautiful a bit like chestnuts but a different flavor mm, they're fantastic and also great for pesto like instead of pine nuts we've used them a lot which is a pretty yummy flavor as well so Cedar would you ever n um, number your brood frames so you know which way to put them back in or are uh, you Probably not because you end up moving them around for various reasons and cycling them and then you'll be keeping quite a database to, for your numbers. Oh, that frame looked amazing in the light there. Look at it. It does, isn't it? It They're looks beautiful. Beautiful fresh wax. Yeah. It's um, a joy to see them when they draw their new comb and start to use it. It's usually, if there's fresh wax it'll be white and then it'll turn a bit yellow and then it will turn brown and eventually almost black after it's been used for brood a lot of times. So it's a mixture of their silk cocoons and also bee footprints. There's a lot of busy bees, a lot of footprints coming in from the outside and you know they don't necessarily wipe their feet on the way in. Okay. <laughs> so is that why it, the, the darker colour, Why, or is it just that it's older and they've used it so many times it's like anything? Or... Yeah, yeah, it's just the bee footprints um, combined with um, the silk from the brood will really make it dark. Each, each time a young larvae spins its cocoon, you've got uh, this little layer of dark silk in there that builds up over time. So there we've got our brood nest back together. It's a good idea to take an opportune moment when bees aren't on the edge to put your, your brood box back on. You might like to use a bit of smoke to, to get them off the edge if they are still on there. We've got a bit of a situation down here though, where there's a lot of bees on our excluder. So we might just give them a bit of smoke to get them to run back up into the box. So we're less likely to squash any as we put the hive back together. So there we go. So you usually add a bit of smoke, they will stir up a little bit, but then they'll settle down again. What's the smoke actually doing to them, Cedar? So there's, the smoke has some, a calming effect and there's a few theories on why that is. One is 
that they think there's a fire and they get distracted doing other duties preparing for if there's a fire. And another one is it masks the pheromones of, of uh, us as mammals because the smoke makes it harder for them to smell so accurately. Okay. If you think about it, we're a mammal like a bear coming in to steal the honey, right? So bees have evolved with that and protecting themselves from things like bears ripping their hive apart. So you can understand why they'd want to give us a sting or two as we approach the hive. Um, so look after yourself, wear your bee suit, use your smoker and make sure you have a nice easy start to beekeeping. Yeah, Johnny wants to know how many times have you got stung today? But I think it was just the one, wasn't it? Um, yeah, one. And earlier on, one almost stung me. You might have seen me flick like that, but it didn't really, I actually didn't get a sting. But I've just got one in the finger there, which I can hardly feel now. It hasn't really, didn't really get me too badly. Sometimes they really get you and it really hurts. And sometimes you can get a bit of swelling and so on, depending on how you react. Um, and of course, uh, there is the okay, very rare that people can have anaphylaxis just as they can from peanuts and stuff. So it's really important to, to know your first aid there and um, make sure you're looking after those around you. But um, for me, um, I don't mind a couple of stings. I don't mind, some people will do all of this with no bee suit on at all. They don't even mind getting stings on the face. I don't prefer, I don't really like getting stings on the face. So I'll wear protection. And if they get really grumpy and start stinging me on my hands, I'll put my gloves on as well. Right, getting some great info on what different people are using in their smokers, which is always fantastic. No, that's great. I love it how everybody just jumps in and right. helps each other. And yep. it's a whole sort of concept is everybody's helping each other learn. It's great. Um, fantastic. Nisi's asking, can you harvest the beeswax before the bees fill it with honey? I guess to use the beeswax to make things maybe? You could, but generally you'd use the older stuff and boil it down and the gunk goes to the, uh, goes to the bottom and your yellow wax floats to the top. So that way you can use the old stuff that you're cycling out. Um, or you might have some honeycomb under the lid. But um, if you really wanted to, you, really, you can take a bit of wax. I mean, the bees won't miss a frame or two. They're so quick at making it again and you could uh, experiment then with the beeswax. Generally people just collect it up as they scrape it all off the top of the frames and uh, as you beekeep you'll be collecting a little pile of wax and you can make some candles with your kids. And, and, okay, so those bees are pretty well off that surface now. You saw them all over the, there. They're now on the, there's a lot on the inner cover though. So um, this is just separated a little bit from the hive. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take that inner cover off. I'm going to lean that up against the entrance so that um, those bees can run in. Then we'll have to repeat that process we just did on closure on the top. So next we're going to lift that up and on to the hive. So it's still a good moment. You can flick any bees in that are on the edge because you don't want to squash them. We pick up our box. How heavy do you reckon that box is, Cedar? Ah, uh, well, let me see. <laughs> probably, uh, I don't know. It's not completely full, but it's probably 70% full. So they've, we've got uh, 15 kilos of honey, plus the frames, plus the wood. So a bit heavy, so watch your back. Now I'm here in this awkward position, so I'm just going to lift carefully. But get help if your back's not real good or take the frames out one by one. Okay. Nice. And that goes on like that. You're trying to line it all up, which I haven't done here. So then it's a process of sliding it into position and seeing if you can get it all lined up. And see, that does it matter when you took that box off your queen excluder was came off with your super? Do you prefer to do it that way, or doesn't it matter whether the queen excluder stays on the brood or not? Doesn't really matter. You can go either way. Okay, we're just about lined up there. Close enough. And if you if your boxes are out of line, you can use one of those hardware clamps used for woodware. The squeeze ones, and that helps just pull it into line without you having to take the boxes apart. That's a good little trick we use sometimes. 
Okay, there we go. But when you've just put it on, they're pretty easy just to, to move a little bit into position like that. And sometimes they do wander over time, but generally the bees stick them together nicely. Okay, so there we are. Now we've got to put the inner cover back on because that one came off. So. Again, just choosing an opportune moment when the bees aren't around the edge. Use the smoke if you need to. There we go. That'll disappear a few bees off there. Some people like to put the roof on on a bit of a diagonal and then twist it into position to move any bees out of the way like that. Then you're just getting any bees that are on the uh, top away before you put your roof on. Nice. Okay, and that completes our brood inspection. Thank you so much for all of your questions and being such an amazing engaged audience and for helping each other learn. If you um, do want a handhold, we've got a great online course at thebeekeeper.org, which people are really raving about, experts from around the world tuning in. Uh, making great uh, content for that and it's also a fundraiser for the bees and habitat regeneration and protection. So before you put your covers back on you want to get all the bees out of the way. You could wait some time or you could just brush them out of the way with a, with a brush or some, a, some foliage from the garden is handy. You can just use that as a little, little brush to get them away. And there we go. That one can go on now. And don't forget the cover up here. Well done, thank you. Happy and healthy bees. Hopefully we get a nectar flow soon and we can start seeing the honey filling up again.